now as a church, but for this morning, for Easter morning, I want you to open, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's in the latter part of the Bible called the New Testament. It's a series of names of cities where letters were written to, and this is one of those letters. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look closely at verses 20 through 23 this morning. I'm going to read a little bit more just to understand the context. Our lives are full, actually, of transforming moments. This, obviously, is the most profound event, Easter Sunday, what it commemorates. It's the most profound moment in the history of humanity. But our lives are full of less profound moments and they do have their own effect on our lives, even trivial things, things that were personal for you. I, I remember for me watching The Lord of the Rings in the theater, and, and it, it affected how I thought about movies. I, I looked ahead to the sequel in a way that I, I don't remember ever doing in the same way before. And you have other technological things, like when the iPhone came out. And even still, when, when new versions come out, you see people lining up. It, it's really affected our society. It's affected our, our lives, our, our way of doing things in a particular way. You, you have other, other things like a person's favorite uh, basketball player or sports player when they entered the league. I remember hearing a sports writer talk about Michael Jordan and, and covering those games and, and the sense of, of kind of epoch-making uh, ability that he had. Or you have people that invent a certain style of music and how when someone hears that music, it, it changes them, it affects them. They think about music, in that case, differently. And then you have profound moments that are more serious. I, I was watching yesterday the video of a woman who received, I think it was a cochlear uh, implant, and she was able to hear out of one of her ears for the first time. And, and just to watch the, the expression on her face and the sense that this, this is a, a life-changing moment. My life will not be the same after this. Well, sometimes, especially with, with more trivial uh, events, you have a, a person in a group who just refuses to acknowledge the significance and sometimes won't even admit that anything significant has happened. They won't even believe in it, and sometimes um, that's, that's me, and I'm sure sometimes that's you. If you give me the right event, people are so excited about something, and I'm the annoying one in the group saying, I just I don't think this is that big a deal. And everybody looks at you as if you would please leave. Their life would be better. They could just get on to enjoying this moment. Why, why, why are you being so annoying? And there's trivial moments where that happens. But in the Corinthian church, that's happening with the most profound event of all. The most profound topic of all, resurrection, a future life for humanity. In the Corinthian church, there's a group of people who are doing that same annoying thing. Well, I, I, don't, I don't really think there is resurrection. And Paul, as it were, looks away from his celebration and fixes his gaze on them and says, What are you talking about? Don't you realize what a big deal this is? How significant this is? How, how can you say that? And then he zeroes in on just how significant it is for them and for every believer that Christ rose from the dead. So I think you can kind of sense a little bit of Paul's tone. We're going to start reading in, in verse 12. You can sense him making eye contact with them like that person in the crowd who says, well, I don't think this is such a big deal. And he begins to point out to them why this is so dangerous for them to think that way. And then he makes a glorious assertion about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin reading in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. And we'll focus specifically on verse 20 to 23. Paul speaking to this group in the church. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, well, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 
If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. What a marvelous section of scripture we get to look at this morning. Paul, in the context, is challenging their belief that there is no resurrection from the dead. They apparently are unwilling to admit that Christ's resurrection took place, or at least they're unwilling to admit that it has any bearing on future resurrection for humanity. They seem to think that this life is all there is, and there may be a place for being a Christian, so to speak, in this life, maybe a kind of a moral person, you follow the teachings of Jesus, but, but it has no bearing because it's basically eat and drink and live and then you die, is their slogan. So perhaps some people prefer a kind of religious expression in this life, some people might not prefer that, but a future resurrection has no bearing on this life because it's not really going to happen. Paul says, what, what, what are you talking about? Consider the implications of what you're saying. And then he gets to this marvelous expression. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Let's just walk through this passage. I'm, I'm going to make three points, um, not because it's Easter Sunday and all Easter sermons should have three points, but because um, I think there's three sections of this passage. First of all, the fact then the foundation of that fact, and then the future implications. All right, the fact, the foundation, and then the future. All right, look down here. Notice what Paul says. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Paul is declaring as fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was slaughtered on a Roman cross, no longer is in the grave, but rose from that grave and now is seated at the right hand of God. He's declaring it as fact. Now I want to zero in on that word. For Paul, the resurrection of Christ is not merely a religious opinion that he has chosen to follow because it makes him feel better. It's, it's not a, a myth that he hopes is true. It's a fact that he knows is true. And for Paul, that is literally the case because he saw the resurrected Christ and he talked with countless people who also saw the resurrected Christ. And he knew that Jesus had been killed on that cross, had been laid in a tomb and had been there Friday night, Saturday, dead and buried, literally. So what Paul is saying is, look, look, Christ has, in fact, risen from the dead. And we have, to, we have to just settle in to the reality of the shocking nature of this fact. There has never been a person who, without any human aid, rose from the dead. Jesus had raised up Lazarus, and, and the young man that was, had, had died was there with his, his mother, and the, the girl that was there with her father, he, he had raised them up. But, of course, Jesus himself did that. He was there. He called them out of death. So you can kind of attach that to the miraculous power of Jesus. In this case, there was no human voice shouting at the grave of Jesus. There was no hand laid on him. He was just there cold in the grave, and suddenly life came into his body. Also important to be aware, Jesus didn't resurrect as a sort of a ghost appearance. That, that's part of the point of what happens in the Gospels when he eats fish in front of them. He's kind of saying, look, look, I'm not just an apparition. I don't just appear to be alive. This isn't just sort of my spirit uh, in an embodied kind of form. No, his, his body was resurrected. His physical body, it was, it was resurrected. It was brought into a new manner of life, but it was his body that was resurrected. It was, it was raised from death. 
Now, sometimes I think because we, we live in a, a culture that just loves sci-fi. Now, my wife hates sci-fi, and so we don't watch tons of it, which is fine with me. But the culture loves sci-fi. And in sci-fi, you can imagine things that you know have no place in reality. So you can imagine a sci-fi movie where all of a sudden in the morgue there's a knocking. You can imagine that. It happens in creepy movies, right? It happens. And they're knocking at the morgue and, oh, this person's alive. Or the person who wakes up, right, when we thought he was dead on, on the slab there. Th this is not an imaginary reflection of something you know can't be real. This is a real thing happening that you could never have imagined. That's what Paul's saying. It's a fact that Christ rose from the dead. It's a fact. It's a physical fact. It's a scientific fact. It's an observable fact. It's as scientific as anything that you can observe in science or in nature. Christ was dead bodily, and then he was alive bodily. It's a fact, he says. And then he makes a claim associated with that fact. Here's a part of that fact. That resurrection was not unique. You notice that in the passage? It was the first one. It had never happened to that point, but it was not unique. Did, did you see that? Look down there at your passage. Look what it says. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And how do we define this resurrection? As the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You notice what he's saying? This resurrection was, was the first of its kind, but it was not the only of its kind. Here's the fact, Paul says. Christ rose from the dead, and guess what? All who are in Christ will have that same experience. They will have that same experience. Those who die on earth will have the same kind of experience that Christ did. The fact of Christ's resurrection is not a solo, singular event. It's an inaugurating event. It's a beginning event. It's the first of a series event. He, he, he's using this first fruits analogy uh, basically to put them to shame. He's saying, look, look, what kind of foolish farmer would you think someone was if they went out and gathered the first gathering of, of part of a harvest, and they looked at that and said, what a good harvest we have here, and then went home and never went back to the field. The first gleaning, the first time they went out to the, the apple orchard, and they plucked a few apples and said, look, these are the best early apples, and they went in and said, well, this is what we have this year. He's saying, no, 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 that's not what a farmer does. What kind of a foolish farmer does that? No, the first fruits give you indication of what the rest of the harvest will look like. You don't pluck the first fruits and think, well, I guess that's all this tree has to give this year. No, you pluck the first fruits and think, oh, what a, a wonderful tree this is going to be. Look, look what it's producing in its earliest expression. Well, that means it's going to keep producing. That, that's what he's saying is the fact. The fact is Christ rose from the dead. The fact is that he is merely the first fruits, the first part of a resurrection harvest. Everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ will be resurrected in the same way. Every single person will go into the ground. Those who are going to die are going to go into the ground one day, you and me. Unless the Lord Jesus returns, there will be a generation that doesn't even experience that. But for most of the generations, unless the Lord returns, we're going to go into the ground one day. We'll be lowered down in there, and our body will be there. Our spirit will be with the Lord, but we'll be in this odd state where we're disconnected. We're not the way God intended us to be, body and soul, together. And then one day it's going to happen just like it happened there. There's going to be an earthquake of power, so to speak, that runs through the earth. The Lord Jesus will extend the call. And what will happen? The harvest will come forth. The harvest just like Jesus. Paul says this is the fact that Christ rose from the dead and that he is just the first fruits of a resurrection harvest that's to come. That's the fact. Then Paul wants to explain the background of that fact, so he talks about the foundation. Look down at your Bibles. He talks about the foundation for, he says, for. He's about to make a case. I, I don't understand why these early churches sometimes argued with Paul. <laughs> so unwise to argue with Paul. So unwise. Really, really dumb move. For, he says, 
For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. There's the first four. There's two foundations here. For as the man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. So if somebody would raise the objection, how could a man bring such an overwhelming event for mankind? How could a single man do that? Paul says, well, there was a man who brought about a similar overwhelming event for mankind. His name was Adam. That was a catastrophic event. This is a glorious event. But the same singular person brought it about. So this isn't the first time a man has brought about an overwhelming event for mankind. As by a man death came, so by a man life comes. So there's a consistency. God has always worked in humanity in a mediator system where one man stands for many. That's just the way God works. It's the way he chose to work. One man stands for many. So for Adam, death came through Adam's sin. So that if you belong to Adam, and if you're here and you're breathing and you're human, you do. If you belong to Adam, if you were born, then you receive Adam's inheritance, and that is death because of the nature of sin. There is no human being, man, woman, child, who isn't a descendant of Adam. And as a descendant of Adam, you get Adam's family resemblance and inheritance. You can't escape it. It comes to you just by being born. The moment you're born, you are seen to be Adam's child, and Adam's children all get death. Through one man, death came. So Paul says, don't, don't be surprised. Let's just consider the natural state of humanity. How many people do you know, he might ask the Corinthians, who don't die? How many people have you experienced over the course of their life who never die? And the Corinthians would have to say, well, well no one. We've, we've never met anyone like that. They all die. Yes, and do you know why they all die? Because they were all born in Adam. They were all descended from Adam. And when Adam sinned, therefore, all of those represented by him received his inheritance of certain death. That's why it's such a waste of time. The amount of effort people make, I think, in our culture to either ignore death or to act like it's not really a big deal. Of course it's a big deal to stop being alive. How could that not be a big deal? Of course it's a big deal. Don't you want to be alive? It's a big deal. Yes, it is. Look at it in the face. People die. Every single one of them. There's never been a human, naturally speaking, who didn't die happens to everybody, some young, some old, some sick, some perfectly healthy, and then in a moment, they're gone. And it all came through one person, such a catastrophic epidemic. So he's saying, don't, don't look at me and, and act as though one man can't cause a catastrophic, cataclysmic event. One man brought death to humanity. But in the same way, because God's consistent, God is consistent, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. In the same way that all those who are in Adam automatically face death, all those who are in Christ automatically receive life. Life after death, life that overcomes death, life that comes out of death. In the same way that Adam was comprehensive, there's no exceptions. There's no person somewhere out in Malaysia who suddenly says, hey, surprising, I, I, I've been living for a thousand years. There, there's no person like that. They all eventually die. The same is true for Christ. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions for those who belong to him. There will never be a person in Christ who suddenly says, oh, wow, I only lived a million years, but now I find myself dying. There will never be that person. There will be no body of a Christian in a grave in the sea or on the land somewhere over the history of Christianity that will stay there when Christ returns. There will be no exceptions. If the Lord doesn't return and all of us are in graves someday, there will be no grave forgotten by Christ because by definition, all who are in Christ will be made alive. First foundation. Then he goes to a second foundation. Again, don't argue with Paul. It's just so dumb. For, for he says, first as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. A single man making a difference for all those that belong to him. 
Notice that? For as uh, by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall be made alive. So here's, I jumped ahead too far, but let me look back. Look at 21. As by a man came death, by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, also in Christ shall all be made alive. So here's the two foundations he's saying here. Look, first of all, God chose to work through a single mediator for all of humanity. All of humanity is in Adam, and then some of humanity is in Christ. And in those two respective heads, <laughs> certainty of a future takes place. In Adam, all will die without exception, and in Christ, all will be made alive without exception. That's the foundation. He says, look, Christ has been raised from the dead, and that means all who belong to Christ will be resurrected. How do you know that, Paul? Well, God always works through a single mediator. In Adam, you may notice all die in Adam. In the same way, all will be made alive in Christ. That's the foundation of my claim. God has always worked this way. Why would we think he'd work any different when he brings his mediator into the world? He's pointing out the consistency of God's activity. He's saying this is how God works. This is how God has chosen to work. And God doesn't make exceptions in how he works. God will do this comprehensively. No Christian will be an exception. No human being will be an exception to death. And no Christian will be an exception to life in Jesus. That's the foundation. That's the foundation of this fact. And then he comes to the future. He comes to the future because you could have an objection that would say, well, yeah, but I don't, I don't see people rising from the dead right now. Apparently, they knew people. He references those who have fallen asleep. They knew people that had died, and perhaps that was bothering their faith. And, and you know, that, that might bother your faith. Sometimes that's, if there's something that I find that attacks my faith at times, it's how long we have to wait until the Lord returns. I find that that, that troubles my faith sometimes. Lord, why does it have to be so long? Why so long? Well, I'm, I'm sure grateful he didn't come right before I was born. But even still, I, I find myself selfish as it relates to heaven. and I, I'm, I'm not as concerned about future generations maybe as I should be. And I want him to come sooner. I, I want the resurrection to come now. And I, I think I'm similar to some of these Corinthians who might say, well, we see a lot of people dying. And, and we miss them. It, it's hard to miss them. So maybe it's easier just to lower our expectations and, and just be okay with life on this earth. And, you know, I can relate to that kind of cynicism. That, that kind of cynicism, it creeps in all over the place. You know, you, you have these huge expectations, and, and then you're, you're really disappointed when you have to wait on them, when you have to wait a long time for something that you, you hope is going to happen, you believe is going to happen, but it doesn't come quickly. Maybe it's just better not to hope for that. Have you ever had that experience? I mean, that happens in little ways, like in relationships. It happens when, when people desperately want to have children, but it's a long time coming. People desperately want to get married, but it's a long time coming. People want to be healed of their disease, but it's a long time coming. Th those are all symptoms of saying, isn't, isn't it better just to embrace the limitations of this life and, and get the most out of it that we can? That's essentially what the Corinthians were saying. So, so, Paul, I, I look at the brokenness of this world and the difficulties of having loved ones die and, and all of the effects of sin, and, and I say, you know, I, I just think it's better to have low expectations and then you're not disappointed. It sounds very reasonable. But Paul says, no, no, there's an order here. There's an order. Each, he says in verse 23, in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So there is a bit of a, a, a hard word here that addresses the temptation to cynicism. Look, there, there is a season of faith. There is a season of waiting. That, that, that's God's calling on the Christian. There's a season of waiting. And yes, some loved ones will fall asleep in the meantime. Even we eventually will fall asleep. We may have to close our physical eyes. It's possible before the Lord returns. I hope he returns today. But, but it's possible we may have to close our eyes or our loved ones may have to close our eyes in death. 
without having seen physically the face of the Lord yet. And there's, there's tears that come, and it's sad, and it's, it's difficult, and it's hard. And Paul says, yes, yes, but there is a waiting that is given to the church. But it's, it's a waiting that is glorious because of its future. Christ, yes, rose first. And isn't that appropriate because he died in our place? He died for us, and then he rose for us, and every successive generation receives the benefit of the good news that Jesus Christ died for sinners, and if you believe in him, you too can be saved. But you have to wait. It's true now, but you have to wait for it. You have to wait, but it will be good when the waiting is over. You do have to wait now. You do. You have to wait. There's an order in God's providence, and God's providence is so good because it's God's providence that caused Christ to die in the place of sinners. It's God's providence that required at his heart and hand the sins of his people. It's God's providence that sent him to the cross and that he willingly received God's wrath against us for our sin. It was poured out on Jesus so that there was a complete and full satisfaction. It's God's providence that he would be in the grave in such a way that there was no doubt that he had actually died and actually borne the curse of death. There was, it was God's providence that he would be raised up on the third day and seen by so many witnesses so there could be no doubt of the fact of this resurrection. It was all God's providence, and now God's providence says, you must wait. You must wait. The resurrection is in the future. Some that you love may die in the meantime. You may die in the meantime. But, but, Christ, the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. What a, what a beautiful phrase. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? It, 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 it basically saying, look, Christ has a possession on earth. And that possession is his people. He has a possession. You, Christian, belong to him. Those that have fallen asleep in Christ, they belong to him. Uh, sometimes... On a given morning, one or the other of my children will, will sleep in. The other ones will be up and will, where, where is this one? Oh, he's, he's still asleep. Wow. He's still asleep. It's not as though when he sleeps, you forget that he's your child. Isn't it great to have three children? Oh, wait, we have four children. Wait. No, you, don't, you don't forget you don't forget that you have a child. Christ does not forget the Christian that belongs to him because they are asleep in the earth. He doesn't forget them. He knows right where they are. And we believe that the soul goes immediately to be with the Lord. And so there's this mystery where we are there with him and yet our bodies are here. But he, he doesn't forget you. He doesn't forget a single one that belongs to him. Why? Because you don't forget the people you died for. You don't forget the people you paid for. You don't forget the people you purchased. You don't forget the people you redeemed. You don't forget the people that heard the call of your voice and responded in faith and affection. You don't forget those people. Christ does not. And when he comes... It'll be like a global Lazarus moment. He will shout to his people, come forth, and they will all obey. They will find, just like salvation, that their dead bodies are suddenly able to do what is impossible for them to do on their own. They will suddenly obey. They will come forth. They will become alive. They will come out of their graves or wherever they have lain, and they will come forth. Their soul will be reattached to a glorified body somehow, and up they will come, and they will meet the Lord in the air, and then we will be with him forever. So the Corinthians wanted to say, can't we just focus on this life? Paul says, why in the world would you want to? 
Why would you want to? And I think he says the same thing to us. Don't get caught up in being in love with this life. It is temporary, and there is a future you are waiting for, and it is much, much better than the life you have right now because it is with the Lord apart from the ravage and devastation of sin. It is knowing the one that saved you. It is singing his song. It is seeing his face. That's what you're waiting for. My kids, and I remember this when I was a kid, they seem like they're always wanting to look forward to the next thing. You ever had that experience? So, so, so they, you know, at, at bedtime, they want to know, what's for breakfast? <laughs> I don't know, but your mother has never not fed you. I promise there will be a breakfast. It's, but what is it, Daddy? I want to know what it is. For the few minutes before I sleep, I want to, to look forward to it. What is it? What's next? I have of one kid, he just loves calendars. And so he wants to know what's the next event. Oh, this birthday comes, and then there's this birthday, and then there's this holiday, and then there's this birthday. There's something in the human condition that is looking forward to something. That when you look out and you see a blank calendar with no either, if you're a, a busy person, no rest, or you're a person that likes activity, no activity, but, but you want to see the thing that you love present in the calendar somewhere, it's something in us that, that, that there's something we're supposed to be looking forward to. Paul says, yes, there is. Yes, there is. What's coming, Lord Jesus? What's coming after we sleep? I'm coming. I'm coming, and I'm coming for you. You belong to me, and I will not forget you. Paul says to the Corinthian church, I think he says to us, don't act like there's no resurrection. The resurrection flowing as it does from the resurrection of Christ, flowing as it does from the sufficient sacrifice of Christ for sin is the great thing for a human to look forward to. That is the great thing to anticipate. That is the thing that should give meaning to tomorrow and the next day. And when you have to go to the next funeral, and one day when you're standing beside that grieving friend, or when you just look at the, the bleakness of humanity and you want some hope, this is the great thing to look forward to. What's coming, Lord Jesus, after we sleep? I'm coming, and I'm coming to bring you home to be with me. Christ the first fruits, and then what? At his coming, all who belong to him. Because Christ was raised, all who believe in him will be raised as well. Let's pray. I'd like to invite the band to come. Let's sing about this one more time.